Okay, well, welcome everybody. Um, I'm gonna be talking about uh, what you can do for a whole season to um, get a healthy fruit crop. And there's gonna be a lot of information covered in this presentation. And I will say that it is gonna be focused mostly on the backyard or small uh, orchard. <clears throat> Those of you are um, real large commercial orchards here, just a word of warning, there's um, maybe not gonna be a lot as pertinent to you, but hopefully you will learn a little bit here and there. So um, the other thing I wanted to mention is that my background, my expertise is in plant pests. So insects and diseases. So I'm no, no expert on um, the production side of fruits like pruning, fertilizing, thinning, irrigation, varieties, et cetera. I will touch on a few of these, but if you have questions about any aspects in that regard, I'd suggest you contact your uh, local county extension office in whatever state you're in. Okay. Um, I'm in Utah, so some of this stuff is gonna be pertinent to Utah, but I did wanna mention that we do offer uh, an email newsletter of pest activity. It's called our pest advisories. and you get an email and it goes to a website like this and there's fruit info and vegetable info. And on this website, you can subscribe. So you just click on that link and um, the subscriptions page, you can select what topic you're interested in. So now we'll get started into our full season of um, fruit management. And I'm, Starting with dormant, we've already passed January and February, but I did want to include this just for knowledge sake for next year. So we're in the winter time and our, the buds on the trees are completely closed and they're dormant. And this picture on the left just shows an apple in the full dormant stage. And um, so the buds are tightly closed. So at this time of year, you can prune your apple and pear trees. It's, that's fine to do um, January, February. And you probably want to remove about 15 to 20% of last year's growth. And that's going to get light in and help with fruit ripening. But also when you're pruning, you want to check for any dead or uh, damaged branches. So this picture on the right is just showing um, what it is, is a disease called fire blight. And it's showing where leaves have remained attached and you get this full wilting of that, uh, <clears throat> the tip of that twig there. And that indicates that it was a disease. And so when you see that and you're doing your winter pruning, be sure and prune those out and ideally about 10 inches beyond that wilted part that you can see. So you can also at this time of year prune your, if you have tart cherries, they're um, a little more hardy, so you can prune those as well. And again, that picture in the middle is the dormant um, bud stage for tart cherries. So that's your dormant timing. So now we're on to early spring and we call this delayed dormant. Some people call it dormant as well, but we call it delayed dormant because it's actually when the tree has started to grow, but we can put that dormant oil spray on. And so what is the delayed dormant timing? For example, apples. It's when you start to see the green of the leaves coming out of the buds to when they're about a half inch long. And then for pears, it's when the buds start to swell to uh, when you, again, you get about half inch or so, you get a cluster of leaves coming out. And peaches and nectarine, Again, it's when the buds start to swell till just before bloom. And cherries is a similar idea. The buds are starting to swell. You can see the little bit of green with those swollen buds. And again, just before bloom. And apricot's harder because uh, it blooms so early, um, but it's the same idea. And then plum is a swollen bud um, to that uh, the leaves coming out in a tight cluster. 
So if you wanted a, your own copy of these pictures, we do have a fact sheet that you could Google critical temperatures for fruit trees and then followed by USU. And then this uh, PDF will come up and it has all these pictures. Okay, so during this time, what are you gonna do? So the first thing I would recommend is, this is your, a great timing for pruning your peach trees. <clears throat> so you're pruning your trees that are a little bit less hardy so that they don't uh, have any risk of winter injury. And again, you're pruning for light and fruit production. Um, this picture on the right, some fruit growers even wait till close to bloom to do that pruning. Um, but ideally, again, it's when you just start to see a little bit of green coming out of those buds, then you know, okay, I'm gonna go out and start pruning my peach. Now, again, I'm not gonna get into detail on the production side, but I did wanna point out some good practices for pruning. Um, so when you're cutting off a branch, you want to find that swelling where the branch meets, meets the main trunk and don't prune into that swelling, but prune right above it. So that you're not leaving what's called a stub, which is a, a part of the branch left over. And you're also not cutting in really closely to the side of the tree called a flush cut. So you don't wanna do that. And the reason that I wanted to point out to wait to prune your peach trees till uh, the delayed dormant timing and also prune correctly is to help prevent this particular fungal disease called Cytospora canker. This um, pathogen needs a wound to enter into the tree and a lot of times I see those wounds um, as being these stub cuts. So you can see the two examples shown on the right. And if you see gumming and you're not sure if it's cytospora, you can scrape the bark away and look for some tissue that has turned brown and that's been killed by the pathogen. So this Cytospora gumming is a whole nother hour presentation, but the point I wanted to make is prune uh, after threat of cold and also uh, don't leave those stub cuts on peaches. All right, so now I'm gonna get into the pests. So with our delayed dormant timing, that's when we put on the oil spray to take care of a few pests in our tree. There's no, um, <clears throat> beneficial insects around, there's no pollinator activity. So it's a great time to target some of our, our pests on the trees. And there's a quite a good amount that uh, could be managed or prevented with this delayed dormant treatment. Mostly what you see here is aphids on um, the different crops, but on apple pear, there's a couple of other pests, blister mites and fire blight that could be targeted. So what I'm gonna do throughout this presentation is in each season, if there's a pest to be managed, then I'll just talk about that particular pest. So I mentioned aphids. Um, so on apple, we have a couple of different species of aphids, the green apple aphid and the rosy apple aphid. On peaches, we have green peach aphid and on cherries, black cherry aphid and on plums and apricot, you can get mealy plum aphids. So there's a whole host of different aphids out there and they're, they're mostly uh, host specific. And they cause this um, tight curled foliage over the course of the, sea, of the spring as they're feeding. Now, the reason we're targeting aphids for this delayed dormant spray, which I'll talk about in a sec, is because they lay their eggs on the tree. So they're overwintering as these eggs, usually near the buds shown in these two pictures. And when the buds start to swell and the leaves emerge, those eggs become active and they start to hatch and crawl around and, and then begin feeding. So they'll feed for a few weeks on the fruit trees, but eventually they will become overcrowded but also they'll have signals that, hey, we need to leave the fruit trees and they'll form wings. And then they migrate to a different crop for the summer. So most aphids on our fruit trees will leave the host 
um, usually by um, early summer, late spring, and they'll spend the whole summer on the other host. So you still may see the curled leaves and the damage, but you may not see any aphids in those leaves because they've already left the tree. So um, the great thing about that is that sometimes we don't do, need to do too much about aphids on our backyard trees um, because they're gonna leave, but also they're providing food for our beneficial insects as well. And again, I'll mention what to use in a moment, but another pest on, and we're, we're talking apple and pear specific that can be targeted with this delayed dormant timing is blister mites. And often people don't see the damage of blister mites until late in the season. So the picture on the right, especially the bottom right, is what people may see towards July and August where you have these brown spots on the foliage. And the picture on the left is on pear. And really, to be honest, these, um, well, the individual brown spots are blisters and inside the blisters are hundreds of what are called areophyid mites. Um, so to be honest, this is just really an aesthetic issue. They don't really harm the health of the tree. So if you saw this late in the season, you really wouldn't need to worry too much about it. So let's blister mites. Um, they overwinter uh, as adults within the bud scales. And so again, at that delayed dormant timing, they start to become active and want to get in on the leaves. All right. So what to use for these various pests, the aphids, the, the overwintering pests in the tree? For the most part, it's going to be horticultural oil. And there's tons of brands of horticultural oil, and their ingredient is mostly petroleum-based, like paraffinic oil or mineral oil. And on the bottom, it's all of these one, two, three, five products. Um, the product on the right has canola oil, and that would also be a good option to use for your dormant oil spray. So they're going to be sold as like 98% oil. So you have to mix it with water. And at the delayed dormant timing, you would make a 2% mixture, which is five tablespoons of oil in a gallon. There are some caveats for the uh, the oil application at the delayed dormant timing. Uh, one is that I mentioned the uh, aphids and eggs and others are in areas of the tree that are in tight crevices and cracks. And so you wanna get full coverage of that spray onto the tree, really focusing on the buds. You only wanna apply the uh, oil when the temperatures are above 45 degrees. So there was a question in chat, um, are we gonna have fruit if we don't have a spring? And um, yeah, we need a spring and we need you know, decent temperatures in which to treat these pests. And also you wanna make sure that, you know, check the weather for that evening that uh, on the day you're gonna spray and make sure the temperatures are not gonna be um, below 32 degrees, okay? So there's you know, all these caveats you need to look at and also, 24 hours of rain, um, rain-free conditions would be ideal as well. So um, that's your, your horticultural oil application. And I did wanna mention one more pest that could be, we could focus on during this timing, and that's fire blight. So this is a bacterial disease that affects um, apple and pear when we're, when we're talking fruit trees. And uh, infections happen through the blooms. But during this delayed dormant timing, the bacteria that overwintered in the tree starts to ooze out of the tree, as you can see on the picture on the left. And um, that bacteria will then spread through the individual tree or to other trees. So it's that bacteria that we want to tampen down and prevent from spreading. So what we do is we put on a copper spray and the copper, what it does is it prevents the bacteria from multiplying and being able to spread. It doesn't kill the bacteria per se. Um, so there's copper that you can buy at any of your local garden centers. Um, again, with the oil, full coverage is important. 
And the nice thing is that if you, you're only going to be applying this if you had fire blight the prior year, okay? If you didn't, don't worry about the copper spray. But if you're applying it, the great thing is that you can mix it with your 2% oil spray and put that on at the exact same time. All right, so um, one last point for this delayed dormant timing is nutrition and in particular iron. So a lot of our fruit trees are susceptible to iron chlorosis and that can be um, remedied by doing something in the springtime. If you wait midsummer, late summer and your leaves look like the pictures shown at the bottom, it's often too late to do any remedying of iron chlorosis. So what I'd recommend is to put down some chelated iron into the soil. Shown on the right is just one example brand and it's mixed with water and in a um, five gallon bucket and you can put it out in trenches around the tree and then cover that back up. And if you um, are going to use fertilizer like nitrogen fertilizer, you really only wanna focus it on your new plantings, not the first year that you plant, but the next year and apple. Most of our peach trees are very vigorous and don't need um, extra nitrogen, uh, similar to cherries and other trees, but apples um, tend to be heavy feeders and new fruit trees. So your nitrogen fertilizer application would be for these trees. So just a summary of this dormant and delayed dormant timing. Um, the dormant, you're gonna prune your apples and pears and tart cherry. And then delayed dormant, you're gonna prune your peaches, apricot, if you need to, sweet cherry. And then all fruit trees, you're gonna, if you need to, if you had the pest the prior year, like aphids or blister mites, then you can put your oil spray on. And then apple and pear, you can mix the oil with copper. And then all fruit trees, your iron and determine your fertilizer needs. All right, so now I'm gonna move on to spring. And um, so we're talking May and June, and this is kind of where the pest activity gets really hot and heavy. So this time period will cover a lot of um, pests, a lot of different topics. So one of the things that can help with pest management is properly thinning your fruit. So that's almost all your fruit trees um, is thinning. So I'm gonna just mention a few words about that. So for your apple, you have two different timings that you could thin. Um, one is a little bit more labor intensive and um, more time constraints, but that would be to go when your tree is in bloom and pluck out at the flower cluster, the blooms around the largest bloom, which is called the king bloom, the one that's right in the middle. And that's gonna be your largest fruit. So that's one option. Um, the other option is to wait till after bloom till the fruits are about half inch diameter and you'll do the same thing where within that individual cluster, you'll thin it to one fruit and usually it's gonna be that center fruit and then thin the apple clusters that they're, oh, I'm sorry, then thin the apples so they're about six inches apart themselves. And then peach and nectarine. These guys are apple and peach nectarine, very important to thin not only for for help with pests, but also just to, for the tree's health in general. And you want some nice, good, tasty fruit. So peach and nectarine space, the individual fruits about six to eight inches apart. Okay, so that's thinning. The um, big topic I mentioned in spring is pest management. So you can see there's quite a bit of pests that I'll mention for all the different fruit crops. All right, so um, apple. Now again, not everyone listening is gonna have all of these pests. So I'm just kind of covering everything that you could possibly see. So powdery mildew. This is a, a fungus that's specific to apple and um, it overwinters on the twigs and the buds. And because it overwinters in the tree, as soon as the leaves come out, they are susceptible to infection. So um, even very early in the spring, we can start to see powdery mildew infections. They can affect the flowers. You see in the picture on the top left, 
um, the foliage can curl up and turn yellow and drop. And if it's really bad, it can actually affect the fruit shown on, on the pictures on the right, where the, the skin of the fruit gets this, this symptom called russeting, that kind of brown netting on the fruit. So those are the symptoms of powdery mildew. Um, and so it is kind of recommended that you do treat it, don't let it go too badly. So you wanna watch for the um, whitish, whitish patches of fuzz to show up right as those leaves start emerging. There's a pear right there. And um, you can apply a treatment um, such as a fungicide to manage it. So the timing, the best timing is right before bloom. And this picture on the bottom is called open cluster stage. And that's when the leaves kind of open up and separate from the middle flowers. And that's the time where if you're gonna spray something, it's going to be able to cover all those leaves. And then depending on what you use, you would wanna repeat the application again, um, seven to 14 days later, two to three times. So I know a lot of you are gonna to wanna to, are gonna to need to go back to this recording because I have several slides that have tables like this and there's no way you're gonna be able to write it all down. So I do recommend going back to the recording to get it. But on these tables, um, I wanna point out that the products I've listed are in order from most effective at the top to a little less effective at the bottom. Um, I've included how long the material may provide protection, like the number of days, whether it's conventional or organic. And then finally, um, some caveats to maybe not using it in certain temperatures or on certain crops. So like I said, I'm gonna have more of these slides with tables like this that um, you'll need to go back to, I'm sure. There's not time to cover everything. <laughs> um, all right, so spraying back to fire blight. So we already talked a little bit about fire blight, but um, it's also an issue in spring because infections happen during bloom. Um, I did want to point out that all of our favorite varieties um, like Honeycrisp and uh, Gala and Fuji are the ones that are pretty susceptible. Um, same with the pears. So that's why fire blight can sometimes be a little bit more challenging to manage. So I mentioned infections happen through open blossoms, okay? Um, I already showed and talked about how the bacteria starts to multiply uh, in the spring, and then it's blown by rain and wind onto those open blossoms, but also even our pollinators or flies can carry uh, the bacteria to the flowers as well. So once an infection happens, um, in a flower, the bacteria then enters the tree and it starts traveling in the tree. So it will move down that, the pedestal down the flower stem. So there's some bacteria oozing there. And um, when it's bad, a lot of the flower clusters in the tree can become affected and wilted, shown in this picture on the right. So the bacteria will continue moving in the tree or move out to the shoots killing that tissue as it moves. And, and here's that um, classic wilted area of the stem that I showed you when you're pruning your apple trees that you'd wanna look for. So for fire blight, we already talked about applying the copper at the delayed dormant timing. So for spring, I mentioned the open blossoms can become infected. And so if fire blight, is a problem in your area, then you could use an antibiotic to prevent infection. So streptomycin would be the most commonly one used for um, the backyard or hobby orchards. But again, it's only during bloom. And bacteria or fire blight infections will really only happen when we have uh, certain weather conditions. So if we had like a four day period of temperatures above 75 degrees, and then we have rainfall that's very, very high risk for infection. So this is another one where you wanna watch the weather. You've had a lot of warm days and rain and your trees are in bloom, then you might consider putting on the, an antibiotic. 
or don't put on the antibiotic and then wait and see if you had any infections. And if you did, prune them out immediately. So I always tell people to check your tree two weeks after full bloom and look for those brand new infections. So this picture on the left sh is showing, um, it's actually not brand new. It's probably more like three uh, weeks or three and a half weeks after bloom. Um, but the idea is you wanna catch these early. And when you catch them early, you don't have to prune a ton out of your tree. You can just prune double the length of the damaged part of that flower cluster. If you wait long time, um, the, as I mentioned, the fire blight bacteria will spread in the wood and you'll have a bigger area of infected tissue. And if that's the case, then you have to prune about eight to 12 inches beyond uh, that infected tissue into healthy wood. So when you're pruning out fire blight in the spring, you do wanna wipe your pruners in between cuts. Um, and we often just use like Clorox or Lysol wipes, just something that's convenient. All right, so moving on to another pest that we see in the spring and that's codling moth. Um, if you grow apple or pear, you should be familiar with this uh, moth. The larvae, they are after the seeds of the fruit. And um, that's their, the main thing that they're after, but on their way to get those seeds, they're damaging the fruit and it's really not edible. Um, and you can see fruits that have been infested by codling moth when they uh, have the frass on the outside of the fruit. And frass, in case you don't know, is the excrement of the larvae or the caterpillar inside the fruit, pushing it out. So just to get a um, quick overview of the life cycle. So the codling moth overwinters as um, a larvae, and then they pupate in the spring to an adult moth. Now, a lot of people ask me, well, I'm gonna put on my dormant spray and that's gonna take care of codling moth. Well, unfortunately, no, it's not um, because they aren't often in the tree uh, that you're spraying. They may be anywhere in the ground cover or um, other parts nearby to the tree. Um, and so your spray is really not affecting the codling moth at all. Uh, so anyway, they emerge as moths in spring and they lay their eggs on the fruit surface and the eggs hatch and the larvae bore into the fruit. And the larvae will spend several weeks in the fruit and then mature, pupate into a moth and the cycle repeats itself. So I know we have people from all over a few Western states. Um, this um, repetition of this generation could happen anywhere from four times if you're in a real warm area to two times if you're in a, a colder area. All right, so managing collie moth. Um, we'll talk about some non-chemical options first. Um, I mentioned already thinning the fruit to a single cluster. That's gonna, um, help a little bit because the codling moths really, the eggs, larvae, like to go into fruit that are touching. If I go back to this lower right picture here, I often see damage where the fruits are touching. So thinning to a single fruit per cluster will help. Um, as the fruits drop from the tree, um, you can mow over those, rake them up, um, bury them in your compost because they may contain some larvae that will eventually emerge as moths. And then if you do happen to have some apple trees that you don't manage at all, um, I would recommend you might consider removing the tree because it's contributing to the buildup of the population of Kali moths for your neighbors or maybe if there are commercial orchards nearby. Another thing that some people have done um, that I've talked to and had a little bit of success with in terms of reducing the collie moth population is wrapping corrugated cardboard around the trunk of the tree. So when the larvae are done feeding in the apple, they'll exit the apple and find a um, protected area to pupate into an adult. And so if you have this cardboard around the tree that's got these um, crevices within it, i.e. corrugated, that's a great place for them to 
stop, hide, do their thing. So the idea is that you apply it around the trunk of the tree uh, around late June and you remove it in mid-July. Now I will say these timings are for Northern Utah. So adjust as needed in your location. And then you wanna apply it again a second time around early August and remove it in mid-August. And by removing it, then you, you would wanna throw it away um, or you could um, destroy the live larvae in there um, so that there's no possibility that these can pupate to adults. Now, one thing you don't want to do is put the cardboard around the tree and just leave it because that's just going to make some great areas for continued cogni moth buildup. Um, another non-chemical option that's more labor intensive but doesn't require any spraying is bagging your apples. Um, so the two best options are shown on the right. Um, in fact, the lower right, the, the wax paper bag you can buy them on Amazon in a big bulk package for a pretty uh, inexpensive price and uh, tie it with a, uh, a twist tie. But actually Ziploc or um, plastic bags work as well. Um, if you go online and do some looking up about fruit bagging, there's a lot of info about nylon socks shown in the lower picture. And, um, Anyone on, from, anyone on from Montana, I believe that, that uh, folks there did some research on it and found that it was not as successful as a control. The moths were still able to lay their eggs through those nylon socks. So if you take this route, the bags would be applied at thinning and you'd wanna remove any fruit that you do not bag. All right, so if you're gonna spray, then we recommend that you spray at the right timing. And so at Utah State University, we put out these traps and we help um, you guys in uh, providing information on when to spray. Um, the traps help us know when we get our first emergence of cogni moths. So with that advisory that I had pointed out that we offer, um, we include whenever cogni moths is active, we include a PDF table that shows the dates of lots of various locations. And again, I apologize for those of you that are not in Utah, this is kind of Utah specific. Um, anyway, the table, uh, it's a PDF document. And at the beginning of the season, this is just for the first generation, I provide like two different options that people can do. And I just wanted to explain that here. So I call it option A and option B. So option A is um, what most of you guys will do. It's the date that you will start to spray with your insecticide. Um, and that's given in, that, in the first column. So option B is an alternative where you apply oil first and then an insecticide at a, late, a later date. The problem with option B is that the timing is very important. So if I've listed a date there, um, May 26th, then you would need to get your oil on on that day, not the day before, not the day after. Um, and the uh, application, as I mentioned, is horticultural oil. And we've talked about for the delayed dormant timing, you're gonna use horticultural oil at 2%. So here I'm saying use it at 1%. So it's half the rate which is two and a half tablespoons per gallon. So you put the oil on first, and then I have a date in the second column under option B of when you would put your first insecticide on. So that's just a way that you can avoid using too many insecticides and also get pretty good protection of the fruit um, during this timing called the period of greatest egg hatch, which is where, um, 75% of all the cogni moth eggs will be hatching during that timing. And some people, they don't have cogni moth really that bad at all. And so instead they focus on protecting the fruit at the, just during that period of greatest egg hatch. Okay, so uh, a lot to think about there. Um, so here's another table of some products. And um, yes, we will get those slides out to you guys that have attended. Um, 
So let's see, some comments here is that um, some products on the label may say, use it on pairs only, um, or maybe you can only use two applications total. So be sure and check the label of the product that you're using. So these are all conventional, and then some organic products as well are, um, there's quite a good list, but you can see with the organic, they don't last as long. So you often have to apply the product more. So I did want to make a um, comment about products that are pre-mixed, meaning they're an insecticide and a fungicide together in one. And um, you are more than welcome to use those products, but I just wanted to say, I personally would not recommend it because, um, not because of efficacy, but because there's a risk of developing resistance. Now, a product that has a fungicide and an insecticide, if you're spraying that for coddling moth all season long, imagine you've applied this fungicide over and over and over again when you really didn't need to be applying the fungicide. And as a result, if there is something like powdery mildew present and it's being sprayed over and over and over again, it can become resistant to that fungicide. So those are premixes that have non-organic uh, ingredients. And there are premixes that have organic ingredients like sulfur plus pyrethrin or neem oil plus pyrethrin. Um, I think there's some that have um, uh, insect, insecticidal soap plus um, spinosad. So anyway, all those organic options would be uh, a little bit better idea to choose if you want to do this pre-mix. Okay, so moving on to another pest that you'll see in the spring. Um, it's called woolly apple aphid. And um, it's not, it's an aphid, but it's not one of the ones that we um, are really targeting during that delayed dormant timing. And the reason is because the aphids are occurring on the roots of the tree as well as they could be in the canopy of the tree overwintering. But they're on the roots and they can move up the tree as soon as the temperatures start to warm. So um, we typically will start to see these aphids. And, and again, they're called woolly apple aphids. So they have this cotton covering on them. We'll start to see them in mid to late spring. So they tend to feed in areas of the tree, shown in the picture on the top left, that are near old pruning cuts or old wounds because they're just in this nice protected area. Um, as their populations increase on the lower left, they'll start moving out to uh, new tissue um, and start dripping a lot of honeydew, which is their excrement. On the top middle, I mentioned they, they're feeding on the roots. You see them in the tree, they're on the roots as well. And as they feed, they cause these swellings. So that's on the, the middle two pictures, swellings on the roots and swellings on the twigs that can eventually lead to a little bit of decline in the health of the tree. So from managing woolly apple aphids, start monitoring in mid-May for the presence of aphids. And um, insecticides that are organic, including uh, insecticidal soap or that 1% oil. Um, the caveat there is that they must come into contact with the aphids, okay? Um, and you can mix the two as well. And that oil will help it become, um, or help the product penetrate through those, uh, the waxy coating. Okay, I'm gonna move a little bit faster, sorry. Um, so now with peach um, in springtime, one of the pests you might encounter is peach twig borer. And uh, in, this is mainly an issue later in the summer when the larvae will preferentially feed inside the fruits. But in the spring, the larvae are out as well, shown in the picture in the top middle, and they are exposed. And um, so then they could be treated and reduce the population. So one application of this product called Bacillus thuringiensis or spinosad is a good idea to apply um, 
either right before or right after bloom. And there you're targeting those exposed caterpillars. Um, and hopefully reducing the population so that you don't have any fruit entry later in the season. All right, another pest on peach nectarine that we see in the spring is Corinium blight. So it's a fungus. Um, as soon as the leaves start to emerge, you can get new infections. We also call this shot hole because the infections will drop out of the leaves um, over time. But the real issue is that fruit can become infected. And these early infections look like little purple spots on the fruits and they may ooze a little bit. And then later in the season, they'll become scabby. And if the fruit is um, left like this and you go to harvest it, it's still okay to eat. Um, the fruit is not gonna be affected too, too much. Um, but we can get infections late in the season um, as well. So not just in spring, it could be all through the summer. And if we get infections later in the season when the fruit is ripening up, then uh, the fruit is not edible. It becomes a little bit more mushy. So perineum blight is one to watch out for. Uh, you wanna prevent any irrigation water from landing on the foliage that's just gonna spread the fungal spores. And if this is a, a problem with your trees that you've had in the past, then you would wanna apply a fungicide. So the, the timing is that's what's called shuck split. And that's when that papery uh, husk breaks off of the fruit root. There's several different options. So um, at that timing, one of the best fungicides is called chlorothalonil. It's been around for a while, um, but you can only use it at that timing, not after shuck split. Other otherwise, there's some other options. The spectricide immunox or Monterey F-stop can be used all season long. So those are, are pretty effective fungicides. If you wanna be organic, uh, the only one I could find is called Natural Guard Copper Soap. So it's a copper, so um, just be sure to read the label carefully. All right, finally for the spring, we have Western Cherry Fruit Fly. And um, so this is a maggot that feeds in the center of the fruit and renders it completely inedible, um, unmarketable. I do wanna comment that this fruit is a serious, serious pest for commercial growers. If they have what's called a zero tolerance, meaning they cannot bring a load of fruit to a processing plant um, where even a single fruit has the maggot or the load will be rejected. So it's very important for us with our backyard trees to make sure we manage them well um, so that we're not contributing to the problem for the commercial orchards. So it's a fly, it overwinters in the soil and the fly emerges from the soil in spring and lays eggs on the fruit. So what I wanna point out here is that uh, when the fruits are green, the fly cannot penetrate the skin of the fruit. So you would not spray your tree for Western cherry fruit fly ever when all the fruits on the tree are green, okay? Um, you just, it's a wasted spray. So the flies can only lay eggs in the fruits once they develop this uh, salmon blush color that forms on the yellow fruit. So that's your indication to know, okay, now I need to start uh, managing Western cherry fruit fly. Some non-chemical options are you could put a tarp under the tree and the maggots, when they are finished feeding, they drop to the ground. And so the tarp will catch those maggots and shake them out, put the tarp back down um, to reduce your population. The dropped fruit on the ground will uh, sometimes harbor maggots. So trying to remove those. And then the big thing is when you're done harvesting the tree, um, don't just pick what you wanna eat. Try and pick everything off the tree because the flies can lay eggs in the fruit through October almost. And so that, again, that's another way that's really contributing to the fly population, not only for you next year, but for everyone else. Um, and then I know some people who have, you know, short trees, they've tried netting the entire tree and that could be something fun to try, but just be sure to tie that net tightly down the base of the tree so the flies can't come in. 
And again, you'll get the slides. You can have access to this information on different products. Um, so a summary for spring, thinning your fruits, and then we have our various pest management um, pests to consider. Again, it's quite a bit. So now moving into summer, um, July through mid-September. So if you have not done much with fertilizing or you didn't put your iron on and you're seeing some weird, what looks like nutrition deficiencies, then you could collect some foliage, send it to a diagnostic lab and get it analyzed. And that will tell you what to apply next year. So at Utah, we have a lab called the um, Utah State University Analytical Lab. Proper irrigation is important over the summer. So just a few points about that. As your fruit's maturing, just make sure the tree gets optimal water. And um, if we have dry periods in August, that's the time when trees um, form their flower buds for the following season. So if the tree is really dry in late summer, there's sometimes can be cases where you, we get what's called fruit doubling. It's not a big deal on backyard trees, but if you want pristine fruit, just maintain that irrigation. All right, so and then in summer, you wanna continue looking for fire blight and continue your sprays to prevent codling moth. And that can end around September 15th. On cherry, continue your cherry fruit fly um, control until harvest and then pick those last cherries. Um, a little bit about bird control. I know some of you guys grow uh, sweet cherries and birds I'm sure are your nemesis. Um, that's a Again, a whole nother topic, um, but there are some uh, bird alarms that people have put out that do irregular alarm calls that scare away birds, uh, scare tape. People have these owls that move back and forth. So whatever you do, you wanna start it before the birds come along to eat your fruit. And then as far as a new pest to manage, that's greater peach tree borer. So that's a summertime pest on uh, peach, nectarine, and plum. So what it is, it's the clearwing moth and attacks the, the tree at the ground level. Um, it can kill young trees. And I, I hear this a lot. Oh, I put in a peach tree and two years later it was dead from the, the greater peach tree borer. Um, older trees can survive, but it could predispose them to other injuries. So just quickly, the life cycle, the, uh, the larvae spend their winter in the tree. And then in um, a late, mid to late June, those larvae then pupate to an adult and they emerge as the moth. And um, she lays her eggs on the bark. And, and again, they penetrate into the lower trunk of the tree and the roots. And so in spring, that's the tree start, the sap flow starts, the tree pushes out a lot of gumming when it detects the presence of the larvae. So that's the tree's defense mechanism. It's trying to push those larvae out. But again, that's only gonna be at the base of the tree, okay? If you see this kind of gumming up higher in the tree, it's not gonna be this greater peach tree borer. So for management of greater peach tree borer, um, one very important non-chemical tactic is removing all uh, weeds, ground covers, whatever plants you might have from the base of the tree. Keep that area clear because the moths really love to kind of just hide and, and get into that, that space. As you see, a lot of the gumming this spring, if you have this pest, um, pull the gumming out and hopefully you'll, you will find um, the white larvae and that's the tree's way of pushing out the larvae. So expose them, kill the larvae. And then um, some people have tried using nematodes, which you can buy at some of your local garden centers or you get it online. And it's sold in this kind of a little clay pack that you put in water and mix it up. And then it's live nematodes. And you pour the nematode mixture around the trunk of the tree. And the timing of that is going to be in, um, spring, so before they start to pupate. And you wanna keep the soil moist, okay? 
So that's one organic option. I personally don't have any experience with it, but I know some people that have tried it. Otherwise, you would want to use an insecticide on, sprayed onto the trunk of the tree. And your first application is going to be when the moths emerge. So again, this is Northern Utah. We start to see them mid to late June. And some of these products, the first two rows, they provide a month of protection. So you're really just spraying the bottom uh, 12 inches of the tree at once a month through September. So it's a pretty easy pest to manage actually. All right, so summer, check for your, um, your, your foliage for nutrition, proper irrigation, and then we talked about the pests. Finally, so for fall um, from mid-September through November, Make sure you get um, your trees a good dose of water and irrigation before the ground freezes. That's gonna help your trees um, go through the winter nicely and be less susceptible to winter injury. And as far as pest management, there is one pest that we do need to watch for or to do something for, and that's the Corinium blight. So we've already talked about Corinium blight. Um, causing infections on leaves and foliage. Well, the primary, another primary time that infections happen is in the fall when the leaves drop. So when the leaves drop, there's this nice fresh leaf scar. And that's where if any fungal spores are around, they will land on that area and enter the tree and cause an infection and kill that bud. And then the following spring, spores will emerge from this area. So the idea is that to prevent those infections, you would apply copper. You can use the same copper we talked about for fire blight um, once those leaves start to, block, to drop. So we consider the application to be around 50% leaf drop because you wanna uh, get good coverage to, to protect those leaf scars. So the summary here for fall, um, irrigate the ground before freeze. You've got your pest management um, activities. And one last thing, real quick, if you've planted a new tree, protect that tree um, from frost cracks, which can happen when the sun heats up the bark. So protect the tree from that by putting on white tree wrap, which you can get on Amazon or, or I'm sure a lot of garden centers. And it, the white tree wrap would be on your tree from December to March. Um, and some people will use a latex paint one-to-one -one ratio instead, but if you just have one tree, the white tree wrap would be fine. So here's my summary there for, um, for fall, um, again, with the white tree wrap. And there's my contact info. So I took up the entire hour um, and I know that Diane and Megan were madly answering questions on the Q&A, um, but if there's any more questions, we can address them.